conversation surrounding KUAF's podcast series, The Movement That Never Was, A People's Guide to Anti-Racism in the South and Arkansas. Before I introduce you to our panelists, we get started a few housekeeping items. We have turned your microphones and cameras off, but we will be taking questions. And we encourage you to ask your question through the chat feature at any point during our conversation tonight. And we will take questions once we hear from each of our panelists. Quick reminder of our community standards for these conversations. In order to create a positive and engaging online environment, we ask that all participants keep comments respectful and appropriate to the conversation. We do wanna hear from you and we do encourage comments and questions, but we are not going to tolerate any hateful, offensive, profane, vulgar, or abusive language. We encourage you to listen actively and attentively and to be respectful of the rights and opinions of others. We do reserve the right to remove any content that violates these guidelines. Finally, tonight's conversation is being recorded and will be available to rewatch and to share with others later. The podcast, The Movement That Never Was, A People's Guide to Anti-Racism in the South and Arkansas, is a five-part podcast series. We're going to be talking about episode four tonight. It is written and executive produced by our first panelist this evening, Paul Kiefer. It's supported by the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. All of the episodes that have been produced so far, the first four, are available at KUAF.com. All right, let me introduce you to our panelists tonight. I'm very excited about the conversation we're going to have. First, Paul Kiefer. He's a graduate of Pomona College. He's a freelance journalist based in Seattle. He wrote and executive produced the podcast. He was an intern with Durham, North Carolina Public Radio Station, WUNC, on their local daily news magazine, The State of Things, and a finalist for NPR's Croc Fellowship. Ms. Sherry Dupree examines numerous cultural stories with oral interviews and documentation to excavate and repurpose them for contemporary concerns on gospel music, the Rosewood Massacre of 1923, and Christian organizational history. And Ms. Lisa Hicks Gilbert, born and raised in Elaine, Snow Lake, and Ratio, Arkansas, a 1986 graduate of Elaine High School. She currently lives in Little Rock, works as a freelance paralegal specializing in business law and contracts, she founded the Descendants of the Elaine Massacre of 1919 in March 2020. Their goal, to reclaim the narrative of the Elaine Massacre, break the silence of the ancestors, and to empower and give voice to the descendants of the Elaine Massacre near and far. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you to the Fayetteville Public Library for, uh, uh, for hosting this. I want to first turn to Paul in Seattle, who is the executive producer of this. And if you have not heard the fourth episode of this podcast yet, I encourage you to do so. It is a truly remarkable episode. Paul, let's talk a little bit about what's included in this episode and how you approached it. It, it covers everything from how systemic racism has uh, developed a, a economic inequity to the thought of reparations. How did you approach this episode, Paul? So in essence, as you know, and also I should say, I'm in Seattle, my heart's in Arkansas right now. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so the, the goal was to address the questions of, you know, the, the key question that came up that, that will come up, you know, time and time again, which is how, you know, what, what do you do to address the wealth gap? What, you know, what strategies exist to remedy the wealth gap? And the two things that people have settled on time and time and time again, one with a very old history, which is uh, some sort of state or federal support for the development of black owned businesses. And the other is reparations, reparations payments on a federal scale, potentially reparations payments on a local scale. Uh, in the case of uh, federal or, you know, state or, you know, city support for, for black owned businesses that, you know, federal programs of that nature date back to the 1920s and have been, you know, in, in some ways, a political tool of administrations on both the left and the right as a way to, you know, at, as a at times as a way to win voters or in the uh, late 60s and early 70s as a way to, you know, an, an attempt to kind of quell uh, post-civil rights era anger. And, the, you know, that's specifically, you know, what it's, it's the, the term black capitalism is most associated with the Nixon administration in, in the wake of um, 1968 and, and the nationwide riots that followed the assassination of, of Martin Luther King. But in any case, uh, 
there is a very long history of sort of experiments with practical implementation of things like uh, low interest loans for black uh, for black business owners, even if the impacts of those on the wealth gap have been negligible, if you know, if any at all. I mean, the wealth gap has actually grown since 1968. The thing that hasn't been thought of in great practical detail, because the conversation always ends at the point of like, you know, is it fair are reparations. Generally, why people get hung up on the notion of whether or not reparations are merited and don't think through what reparations mean on a practical level, what what reparations policy looks like and what it would, how it would function on a federal scale. What's missing from the episode, though, is the fact that reparations on a local scale, not necessarily reparations for slavery as a whole, but reparations on a local scale for, for uh, racist massacres in the past, have you know either you know movements to secure those reparations are underway or movements to secure reparations by another name as was the case in Rosewood, Florida have already happened and succeeded in, in obtaining payments in the case of Rosewood from the state um, to address a historic wrong do, uh, wrongdoing. Um, so the goal of this town hall is to you know is to say in the episode we can talk all we want about what a federal reparations policy looks like as presented by William Darity who's sort of the expert on the matter from Duke in Durham, um, but our two guests today um, are uh, associated with movements to push for, or that have already succeeded in securing uh, financial restitution for uh, a specific historic wrongdoing and who can talk through what those programs look like on a local scale and what their impacts are and about the incidents that sparked them. So that's what we're doing today. Thank you, Paul. Um... Sherry, let's go to Sherry Dupree, who is in Florida. And as Paul mentioned, I, 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 we're going to talk about your efforts. But first, if you don't mind, um, many people may not know about the Rosewood Massacre that took place in 1923. Um, can you give us just a bit of a background on that? Yes, I'd be pleased to. The Rosewood Massacre started on January 1st of 1923. Rosewood is located in Levy County in the state of Florida, which is near the water. It's just nine miles from the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So uh, on January 1, Fanny Taylor, a white lady, claimed an African-American had assaulted her and uh, had beat her up and bruised her and so forth. Her husband was away at work at the mill at the Kuma Lumber Company. The person that came in was her lover. They had been seeing each other for years and uh, on New Year's morning, for some reason, they had this altercation. Well, the lover left and uh, she could not allow her husband to come back from the mill to find her all bruised up. So when he returned, his name was James. When James returned, she screamed and hollered that a black man had been in her house, had assaulted her, she was bruised and so forth. And so this is what started the lie. That was not so. So in any case, um, James and the people in the mill formed a posse and called in the sheriff. The sheriff's name was Bob Walker. And they said they had to find this person who had assaulted Fanny, a white lady. So therefore, uh, the massacre was beginning at that point with local people. And then it spread it out, of course, to people from all over the area. But then after that occurred, uh, they got the hunting dogs, you call them posse hunting dogs, and the dogs sniffed their way over to Sam Carter. And Sam Carter was a blacksmith. And so they said, okay, the person came here, that, that was in Rosewood. Uh, Sam Carter had taken the uh, corporate uh, fellow to the waterways. He had carried him to the Waukesha River. And by the way, his name was Bradley, his last name. And Bradley went to him because they both were Masons. Even though he was a white fellow and this was a black fellow, he said, we Mason together. So therefore you must help me. And he did. He, he carried him to the waterfront and left and came back on his wagon and went to work at the uh, blacksmith area. The posse got together and the dogs went straight to this location to the blacksmith's place. And so they said, um, tell us where he is. So we know he's black. And so the, um, 
that was not to be known. He said, I don't know anything. I'm a 22nd degree Mason. I can't talk. I don't know. So to make a long story short, um, the dogs uh, kept sniffing around the wagons and so forth. And they found out that the wagon tracks had gone to the Walker Saucer River. Also, they found out that the wagon tracks were a little deeper in the ground going. And then on the way back, the wagon tracks were a little higher, which lets you know that there was someone in that wagon going and less people or less equipment in the wagon coming back. And so to make a long story short there, that went on and then night fell. The bottom line was that Sam Carter was killed because he never told exactly where and who he had carried. The posse had grown quite large by then, county-wise and almost state-wise. It was just growing because people were coming. The word got out by way of the telegraph, and it got out by people carrying the word. But the key thing was in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, Gainesville is where I am right now. In 1922, uh, they had the Ku Klux Klan rally here. So by having that rally here, you had Klansmen from all over, from Mississippi, Alabama, different states had come in for the rally and for the weekend. And once the word got to Gainesville, they had plenty of people to come because they wanted some action. So they came to Rosewood. But then in their coming to Rosewood, they went to Aunt Sarah's house because the dogs went there. And when they got to Aunt Sarah's house, they asked her, she was upstairs, said, uh, tell us who it is. Uh, who, who's this black man? And she said, I don't know. And in telling them that she did not know, they killed her. They shot her and knocked her back onto the bed. She was upstairs on the second floor. Sylvester on the first floor was down underneath the staircase with the gun. Two of the white men decided, well, we're coming in the house. And they started in and he killed both of them. Uh, so those two men were killed on the porch. Other whites were rallying outside and they fought and shot into the home until they were out of ammunition. That was a night. So after that happened, the African-Americans got word that they had to get out of the community quickly because they had ramshacked this house and two white men were dead. They didn't know yet how many black men were dead. Several had been killed on the road and they were looking for Lord God and they were looking for those that had been in prison uh, they were just looking for black people and several people were getting killed. So the women and children had to run to the woods and they stayed in the woods for several days and nights as the fighting continued. All the homes were burned down. All the barns, all the, everything was destroyed in the Rosewood area. So it was decided that they needed to get the women and children out who were hiding in the woods. And uh, a train engine was uh, put together, a train engine and two box cars uh, were put together. And they sent the train through the black neighborhood, through the woods with signals to pick up the women and children, which they did, and got the women and children out of Rosewood. Now this was on January the 6th. And that is very significant because this is when you had the situation in Washington, DC was January the 6th. So we can relate very carefully to rioting and, and uh, acting in undue forms. Okay, now after they got the women and children out, the first stop of the train was really Archer, Florida. The second stop was Gainesville and on out. So the women and children were able to get out. Several of the men lost their lives down there and the city was burned completely down. That was churches, the Masonic Lodge, two businesses, and everything that they own. And after that, on the 7th, it started to slow down. Now, after all of the things occurred, no one was held accountable. The trial was held in February in Bronson, Florida, and no one knew anything. So they couldn't identify anybody from the mob, and everything was clear. It was all over. The town was gone and the people did not return. That's in a nutshell, the story of the Rosewood Massacre. My God. Uh, so 98 years ago. Absolutely, 98 years is that. So what has happened in the near century since towards any sort of... Um, reparation or reconciliation or acknowledgement 
of, of the massacre for the descendants of those killed. Oh, yes. A lot has happened since that time. But you have to keep in mind, the people were very frightened. They were afraid. They had nothing to go back to. They had to find family members and other friends in other cities to take, help take care of them, their families. So it was a very fearful time. And for many years, they only talked about it in whispers. Others had nervous conditions, uh, psychological stress, all kinds of issues relating to what had occurred. And so um, after uh, a few years, they had a man by the name of Gary Moore to come down to Rosewood area and uh, to write a story. And he was writing a story for the St. Petersburg Times newspaper. And when he got down there, people started telling him about what happened in Rosewood. So he got permission to stay a month in that area. And he wrote the first printed copy after the time of the Rosewood massacre. <clears throat> and it was placed in the St. Petersburg time at that time. Now in 1983, CBS News with what they call 60 Minutes, and I'm sure we've all seen 60 Minutes from time to time. Ed Bradley went there and he uh, went back to Rosewood with family members. As quiet as it was kept, Ed Bradley's grandfather was one of the people there in Rosewood at that time. But anyway, when he went back in 1983, he took some of the family members and many had not been back. That was the first time. And the story was beginning to pick up steam. People began to remember. In 1985, the uh, family reunion was put into place. And uh, from the family reunion in 1985, they would come together and they would whisper and talk about it and share it among themselves because they were still scared and nervous about how things would happen for them. So after eight, 1985 and the uh, family reunion said that they were gonna do something about it. Justice need to be served. They lost thousands of acres of land down there you had 13 family, prominent families. You had more than 13 families. And I'm talking family members that own as little as 40 acres and as much as two to 300 acres. So you know it was a large area. It was a huge farming area. So they decided, yes, we, we're gonna do something about it. They filed a claims bill with the state of Florida in 1991, it failed. They filed a second claims bill, 92, it failed. So the government said, uh, well, we don't wanna deal with this. The family and others got together with the legislators and said, oh yes, we do need some closure here. So a study was done for the year of 1993. And uh, Dr. Maxine Jones at Florida a &M University was in charge of the study. The study was number one, to prove Rosewood existed because people said it didn't exist. This, you all are crazy. This, this isn't real. This didn't happen in the state of Florida. We wouldn't do anything like that. Second, the people wanted to know if these were individuals who actually were in Rosewood. We had enough survivors still living to tell the story. So these people were interviewed and they had 12 months to get their stories together and a big volume was turned into the state of Florida with all the interviews and so forth. But one thing I need to say to you, the Indians, the Seminole Indians were very helpful to the African-Americans during this time. And during the time of 1993-94, uh, they put two reporters for the Seminole, Tri Seminole Tribune newspaper on the story. And this is the part that people don't see and know anything about. The Indians had kept good records of what had happened all these years. And they reported in their newspaper every month on what was going on. So when the report went back in, the legislators were just couldn't accept it. These folks are real. Yes, they are. These are black folks, yes. There are some white folks, yes. So several people had been interviewed and so forth. And then it came up for the spring meeting. And of course, at that time, it was voted upon. Now consider this is a claims bill. And with the claims bill, it's not taking any funds from any other division within your government. So as a claims bill, they said, we will look at it in that format. And they did. 
they had to have enough legislators to get the bill through to pass. And they did. And how did that happen? Many of the um, legislators and others in the southern part of Florida, down near Miami and those areas, were very much in favor of it because many of those folks had lived through atrocities as well. They were from various cultures and what have you, from the islands and so forth. So we had strong support there. We did not have strong support in the panhandle. This is the area going out of Florida and so forth. And so we knew that, but the point of it was the bill continued and the Black Caucus was in the corner of making sure it got through. So the bill passed. And once it passed, then they um, had to finish deciding how it would be spent. So each one of the family members living that came out of Rosewood received $150,000. Now these were old senior citizens. They were not really able to enjoy that money. Most of it went for health care because of their ages. So that was one thing, the 150,000 and that went to nine people nine people received that. Next, it was set up so that a scholarship fund would be available for the recipients, uh, the, the um, descendants. And the descendants receive a scholarship by asking for it. And so you would go to the state, to the education division and ask for the scholarship. And then they have a, a map and then they also have the family tree and prove that you were one of the family members in the line of service through the family. And therefore you would receive uh, right now it's at $6,100 per year. You do not have to go to college. You could be a truck driver, whatever it is, you would be using those, that fund to help you to be a better citizen. And so many of them have taken advantage of that. And I counted at the end of the year, there were over 280 who had taken advantage of the scholarship. The other thing, the scholarship money has to be used in the state of Florida. So that kind of narrowed it down. There, there are some stipulations there toward the scholarship. Now for other family members who uh, had land and so forth in Rosewood, they received a percentage of funding and the average funding there was between two to $4,000 depending on the amount of land, depending on the uh, family member's relationship, like an aunt or uncle, or a niece or nephew who had an aunt or uncle who was killed in that area and they could prove it, they probably got three or 4,000. There was a chart that was put together based on how the funds would be distributed among family members. So therefore the 2.1 million was distributed in those formats. Now. The state of Florida said immediately, as soon as that bill passed, this will never happen again. So they put another law into effect saying that this is the end of that. So that's pretty much what occurred with Rosewood and a little bit of the aftermath. Thank you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go from Gainesville, Florida to Little Rock, Arkansas, Lisa Hicks Gilbert. Uh, Lisa yes. went to high school in Arkansas. Lisa, I did too. I'm a little bit older than you. Uh, I did not know about the Elaine massacre until well past high school. And uh, let's let's in case there are other people who are, are with us for this town hall tonight who don't know about Elaine. What can you tell us about what happened in 1919? Mute. Okay. All right. It's letting me on mute. Okay. Okay. Hold on one moment for me. It's okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Um, the Elaine massacre. Uh, the Elaine massacre occurred in, it started September 30th, um, 1919 at the Hoops for a church. And that is three miles up from Elaine. And it was sharecroppers who were organizing to get a fair price for the cotton that they grew and they had harvested. And also they were in contact with attorneys to help sue the store owners um, for you know, a fair settlement of their accounts. They would, you know, as sharecroppers, 
at the beginning of the year when they needed to get their um, you know, supplies to grow their crops and uh, maybe household goods, they would take up those items at the store. And usually the store was owned by the landowner which, you know, on whose land they work. And so they were having some issues with getting a fair price for their cotton. And also when they went to settle their accounts, they would usually owe more than you know, the amount mm -hmm. uh, that was owed to them for harvesting for, at the end of the harvest year. And so they were organizing the household, the farmer's household union. And they were at the church that night. And, and it's not told in a lot of the you know, books that are written but there had been trouble before. They had been warned, there had been threats, there was intimidation that had been going on because there had been previous meetings uh, about them organizing. And there was Robert Hill who was helping them to organize and um, helping them to you know, find an, an, an attorney to help them sue the landowners. So that night at the church, and it was late, the meeting was late, and they were all there meeting it estimates of two, some people say 200 then 150. So, you know, we usually say 150 is 200 people, men, women, and children in the church that night in Hoopsburg. And as they were starting the meeting and, you know, there were armed guards, they had, armed, because of the intimidation that was happening and the threats that were being made about them organizing, they had put armed guards outside of the church. And, um, two or three vehicles pull up and the shooting starts and they start shooting into the church. And one, the, uh, one of the officers or deputies that they say, a uh, white man was shot and they're conflicting of, you know, accounts of if, you know, if it's a self-inflicted uh, wound or if one of the sharecroppers shot him or if uh, someone he was riding with shot him. But anyway, he was dead. There was a white man dead. And uh, there were, you know, the people were jumping out of the windows of the church. And, you know, the officers, they went back to the deputy sheriffs, all of those in the, in the trucks went back to Helena. And the next morning, they came back, they had gathered a posse, KK, they had uh, KKK members coming all the way from Mississippi coming and from the you know counties from all of Arkansas because they went when they went back to Helena the tale was that the Negroes were organizing and threatening to kill the white landowners and you know take their property take their land from them so that was the lie they went back and told because they had to make up something to explain how this white man was killed and you know they said that they accidentally stopped by there you know just happened to stop by the church and um, that's when, you know, the sharecroppers started shooting at them. Well, the next morning, after they gathered this posse, they come back and there's still bodies in the church, in Hoopsburg Church, and they burn it down with the body still inside. And they start just shooting to kill black people, men, women, and children. And a part that's not, and I think someone had written a little bit about it in one book, but from the accounts, and I'll tell you a little something, um, you know, a lot of times they don't talk about these sharecroppers, this is 55 years after slavery. Some of these uh, sharecroppers, some of these men were born slaves. Mm -hmm. And then you have, some of these men were uh, soldiers. They had just come home from World War I. And so they're armed, know how to shoot, know how to fight, and they were not going down. And, you know, one of the stories I uh, told to my grandmother by a survivor was when they, these, they were hiding when they saw the, you know, the KKK and this mob coming and started shooting and killing them, that they sent, you know, they were hiding in the thicket, hiding. They sent a rider to Lambrook, that's just right in the back of Elaine and to gather up some more of the sharecroppers and they came armed and they fought off, you know, the mob, fought off the KKK. And, you know, uh, the sharecroppers, they outnumbered the white people in Elaine, in that community, you know, um, I, I mean, they outnumbered 500 to a thousand. 
So they outnumbered them and fought them all. And that is one of the reasons why they knew they couldn't defeat the sharecroppers. They went back to Helena, mm -hmm. uh, wired the governor and said, send troops. There's an insurrection. The black sharecroppers, the black people are threatening to kill uh, the white people, men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And that is how the troops end up coming by train on the second morning with machine guns. And that's when a lot of the slaughter, and that's why I always term it, the slaughter takes place in Elaine. And there are accounts, a lot of different accounts of how many uh, were killed. Some people, you know, it, it was recorded that uh, five, you know, in some newspapers were killed. Then there's reports of 150 to 200. My grandmother, you know, was told there were hundreds killed because you got to understand that's a military coming in with machine guns mm -hmm. shooting and killing at random but after the mass after you know the massacre uh the troops restore order there are more than 200 uh of the sharecroppers who were arrested um um uh, charged quickly um you know convicted and sentenced and some of the trials lasted six minutes, mm -hmm. um, six minutes. And as they call the ringleaders, the, then, you know, the Elaine 12, this is, you know, part of, uh, they were sentenced to be executed because they felt that they were the ringleaders in this. And these Elaine 12, those were primarily the ones who were running the lodge and who were uh, the leaders and the um, board of, you know, organizing the Farmers Household Union, that, that chapter, that large division right there at Hoopsburg. They had another chapter down in Rashaw, you know, down on, you know, further on down. They had many chapters, uh, but that massacre happened to happen that night, September 30th, started in 1919 uh, at Hoopsburg. Um, but there's a lot of, of the Elaine massacre that hasn't been told, but the aftermath of the Elaine massacre was, you know, the years that the Elaine 12 spent fighting for their lives, fighting to be free. And during the time they were incarcerated, they were being tortured. Um, and one of the part I, I feel that gets left out a lot is you have 12 men who are in there being tortured. Um, you know, they're making threats against their families, their wives. And they're hearing the stories that their homes have been ransacked, that, you know, the landowners and different people have come in and taken all they own, um, leaving their families penniless, families being, you know, um, just dispersed all over the place. And during those years that they were incarcerated, that they were being tortured, they didn't know if they were going to be executed. They never turned on each other. Not one time did they turn on each other. And eventually, and then in comes, you know, Scipio uh, Jones, the attorney out of Little Rock, um, who helped them fight and win their freedom. And, you know, at, once they were free, the 12 men, called the Elaine 12, they had to, you know, go into hiding. And my ancestors, Ed and Frank Hicks, and I just learned this in 2019 because I always wanted to know because they said they all had to separate, but Ed and Frank Hicks um, never were able to be in contact with each other again. And that was for their safety, for the family's safety, for everyone's safety. They, all of these 12 men who have spent all of this time together uh, fighting for their lives, for their freedom, were never able to be in contact with each other again. But the, um, I think the question is, what is the aftermath of the, the impact of the Elaine massacre, uh, especially, and I'll speak to especially the impact on the, you know, on the community. The, I call it the deadly silence of this massacre uh, and what happened in Elaine, what happened throughout Phillips County. I only learned about the Elaine massacre you know, I'm born and raised in Elaine. Never heard one word. Graduated from Elaine High School in 2006. Um, our 
high school closed, our schools closed in Elaine. And we had an all school reunion. And the mayor at that time's wife came and she did the history of Elaine. She went back to its origin. And I remember, and I was, it was so fascinating for me to hear about you know, Elaine, the history of Elaine. And I'm saying this is 2006 and we're sitting there big PowerPoint, the screen, all of this, all of this, about two, 200 or more of us, of us there in the elementary school in Elaine. And she went through this extensive history, all the pictures and never, not one word was mentioned about the massacre. She went from the beginning all the way to when the school closed. And we all, and most of us in this room never, and this is 2006, didn't have a clue that the Elaine massacre had even occurred, you know, even happened there in, in, in our community. So when I found out in 2008 by accident, um, just saw the book Blood in Their Eyes on, um, on the internet and went a couple of weeks later and asked my grandmother about the Elaine massacre and if that was true, because I didn't believe it was true. But the um, aftermath of Elaine and the, uh, the massacre and this impact um, on our community, it, I mean, it, it's hard to measure. There is, you know, still to this day, very little black ownership. Um, it's still a uh, divided community. Elaine is still a divided community. You still have the black side of town and the white side of town. And the racism still exists there, not just in Elaine, but throughout Phillips County. The landowners still to this day, uh, we, you can have a mayor, you can have a mayor of Helena, you can have a mayor in Elaine, but the landowners still rule. They still say what goes, what happens in Phillips County. And that's been evident by industry. If they don't, and you know, and for years they didn't want in the industry to come in because the industry would take their, their labor force from their fields. So um, the, you know, just the immediate impacts of it was the, to me, for me was the silence and the trauma that they experienced. And one of the ways for, um, you know, of the hundred, more than 100, defendants that were arrested in order for them to even be released the landowner had to come and vouch for them come to the down to the uh, you know uh jail and vouch for them and they had to sign that they would not organize or have any more meetings unless they got permission from the landowner they worked for oh. so they had to get permission to organize the only thing they were allowed to attend and go to without permission was church. So um, those immediate impacts um, of the Elaine massacre. And I know the descendants of Elaine, you included, mm -hmm. uh, have been mm -hmm. pushing for a combination of, I mean, it depends on which person, but a combination of financial mm -hmm. restitution and education. Could you talk me through kind of the past several years of, of advocacy for, for some sort of action on the state and and and, uh, and what, what you're calling restorative justice? Well, uh, what we, the descendants, now I've only, we've only had the descendants of the Elaine Massacre um, group for almost a year now. And we're currently what we're doing is working in conjunction with the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement uh, on Senate Bill 591. Mm -hmm. And this is, mm -hmm, and then and included in this bill is uh, to have the 122 defendants from the ELA that were charged, you know, falsely charged, have them fully exonerated. That's, mm -hmm. done, that's included in the bill. And we're also creating a commission that's going to, um, you know, talk about the, you know, social justice, uh, restorative justice, and also the educational piece at, you know, working with the Department of Education on ensuring that the uh, Arkansas, the black history in Arkansas is taught and especially ensuring that the Elaine massacre, that story is told in its entirety, you know, and that is not watered down. And of course we had conflicting uh, legislation recently introduced that 
was in direct contrast to what we were trying to do. And, you know, thank goodness it failed um, that, you know, they were trying to, you know, keep black history from being taught in the high school and even in college. Um, so, you know, that's part of legislation of the Senate Bill 591 and to have the uh, 122 Elaine defendants that were falsely charged, have them fully exonerated. And who are, who are the primary supporters of, of that outside of the descendants and, and, for, and for financial restitution, if, if, if that's possible? Okay, well, one of the uh, people we have on board who's uh, supporting 100% behind us is Senator Joyce Elliott. Mm -hmm. She's carrying a bill uh, for us right now. There are other uh, legislators that are on board as well. But we, it has, it's, it's gaining support, has uh, a lot of support behind it. And this is the second time it didn't fail the first time, but it just needed some, you know, more context to it. And uh, so this is the second time that we're attempting to introduce it. So what's on my mind is, I mean, in the case of both Rosewood and in the case of Elaine, there is sort of a, a science that's been developed to calculate the impact of these massacres, um, mm -hmm. long-term impacts, financial and social. Um, yeah. and, and I know that there's been recent kind of a handful of economists have pitched in to try and study, you know figure out how you calculate the the actual financial impact of, of the Elaine massacre on yeah. descendants in 2020 dollars. Could you talk me through? I mean, what kind of documentation exists that people can rely on, and and two, how are people kind of turning that into estimates of of the you know the long term uh, effects financially on descendants? Uh. Oh, go ahead, uh, Sherry. Well, I just wanted to make a comment in regards to Rosewood and part of the claims mm -hmm. bill that they passed, there was a section in there that African-American history is to be taught in mm -hmm. all counties. And we have 67 counties. Mm -hmm. And they set up uh, a task force. And I've been on the task force for many years. I'm off of it now. But the concern mm -hmm. was that African-American history was to be taught in all schools. Uh, K through 12, not on the college level, K through 12, starting with the fourth grade and going up because the first three mm -hmm. grades is kind of difficult for them to understand the details. This has happened, but it has not gone into effect. Right now, we have less than 10 counties out of the 67 counties that are approved to teach African-American history. And we have standards that we go by that we have to check to make sure that they meet the requirements. The key one is that the teachers must be trained and know the history so that they can teach it. It is to be infused into education. By infusing it into education, that's all subject fields, not just black history. All mm -hmm. subject fields is to be infused. So you've got one white scientist, you're gonna need a black scientist and you gotta talk about the different cultures. Now mm -hmm. the state of Florida uh, has it on the books. The law is there, but it is not being uh, adhered to. And those 10, 11 counties that are in compliance are those in the South down near Miami and those areas where you have a high percentage of different cultures and of course, they want to teach the history of the different cultures there. Uh, working on the task force, I went around to teach uh, teachers and give them history on the state of Florida. And we've had all kinds of problems because the teachers would not even come to the workshops. And we give them credit, three credit hours, and you need that to keep your certificate. And sometimes more, you know, for your different subject fields, science, math, whatever and they would not attend, or a few would attend. We set up trips for them so they could actually go to areas and communities and see the uh, black community. And that didn't go very well. Uh, they would hide, wouldn't come. So I'm saying to you, yes, we have tried just that. That's just one thing. And we are continuing to do that. Now this year has been the best year. We've done more in the churches and we've gotten more into businesses. You've got to get the businesses to come along with you. These companies have come in your area and set up their big businesses and they don't know the black community other than for the workers. You have to encourage them to set up black history as well. And we've done uh, fairly well with that this year, bringing in more of the businesses 
to talk about black history, at least half of black history day. What they want to do is have a cooking day where they cook greens and peas and so forth, which is fine. And a dressing day, which is fine. But again, we need to stress more of the history. And this is for the state of Florida. Things are on the book, the laws are there, but they do not adhere to the laws. Which actually points out a, a, a pattern that's emerged every time that anything akin to reparations has been passed on a federal level, which is, you know, for instance, when under the Reagan administration, the federal government passed a bill allocating, uh, you know, reparations payments to, to surviving uh, Japanese Americans who'd been interned. Yes. That bill included a stipulation requiring, edu you know, requiring federal investments in education about internment. And though that portion of the of the bill never actually, you know, was, was never fully implemented in the way that the direct cash payments to, dis to the surviving people who've been interned were. So I think it's just worth highlighting. And I'm glad you bring this up that when we talk about, you know, what co what contemporary practical reparations policies or reparations proposals look like, they almost always include some element of education, but that's an element of those bills that might not always fall, you know, go, follow through because it requires the, the participation of people who may not be supportive of the bill to begin with. Absolutely. So, Another thing we did when we still do, we put up a website during that month, you know, special, trying to get people in their counties and communities to get involved in certain activities relating to their communities trying to encourage growth. Our biggest growth has been through the Black church. The Black mm -hmm. churches make sure that they include African-American history and some of the integrated churches as well with programs and so forth during the month to commemorate people and different activities. I, I wanted to uh, speak a little bit about, um, you know, reparations. Yes, we yeah, we I mean, and Sherry, what we've been doing is we haven't made it as far as we haven't made it to that part. We're still get trying. Yeah, we're still trying to get Arkansas to acknowledge and recognize and admit that the Elaine massacre happened. And that's you know, something that we had to do the same thing. Yes, uh, just and at and getting them to acknowledge it. Study. You know, yes. interviews and I'm sure you all have done interviews of your relatives. Mm -hmm. And that's yes. right there. And then you get people to document that history by making mm -hmm. sure what they said was actually true. And yes. so we can work mm -hmm. together and hopefully help you get some other things done. You know, to we support. we we'd love it. We would love it. We are, um, you know, just and, and one of the things, you know, we're talking about reparations yes. and, I, and reparations. It, and I like the word reparations. And I always use the word restorative justice because, you know, reparations means to repair. Yes. You know, and uh, replace. Mm -hmm. And I think about these sharecroppers and, and a little part of what they were doing. If, if anyone reads the bylaws of the house, Farmers Household Union, it tells the whole story of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They weren't asking for anything free. Now, cotton was at a premium. That yes. was one of the determining factors at that time in 1919. Cotton was at a premium. They knew it. They were told about it. Robert Hill was so, he, he, he was organizing them because he knew of some land down, it's just down between where I was raised, Rashaw and Melwood. That was this, this big swath of land there. And even in their bylaws, you see where uh, they were talking about paying your dues and that your dues would be kept in a bank in Winchester, Arkansas. Winchester is, is, is you know, down below the east mm -hmm. of um, Winchester, Arkansas. And they were going to use that money to buy land. Now, 1919, and people are hearing about places like Tulsa that's booming, the Black yes. Mecca. Yes. Every sharecropper, you coming back from the military, uh -huh. you, you know, and... Tulsa was the, you know, this is what we're going to do. And this is what my ancestors, this was, you can see it written right in their bylaws. Mm -hmm. I've taken their bylaws and I haven't gotten my, done the nonprofit yet. I'm working on that. But for the descendants of the Elaine massacre, our bylaws are going to be right in line with what my, our ancestors bylaws, mm -hmm. with the household farmers union. And that and is they were, important. And yes, that, and they, they were. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, all of it was based on money and land. 
about money and happened yeah. was economics. And this is what people don't want to talk about. They exactly. Could, and then you were uh, progressing too fast. Same thing with Rosewood. They had a bank down there. But see, when the Freeman's Bureau came through and they were able to get uh, banks and other things of that nature in their community, mm -hmm. this really mm -hmm. caused a big riff. And oh, course, yeah. 1921 and 1919 in your area, 1923 mm -hmm. in several you, other places. You look at those years and what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. And they could not accept your progression. Exactly. And that's what it was called, the progressive, the progressive household farmers union. They even had the word progressive uh -huh. in the organizing name. Yes. And they were and they had plans. Everything was written out and mm -hmm. what they were trying, what they were uh, you know attempting to do. But right. they needed that, yeah. But the powers that be needed that lie to say that they were trying to kill white people and take the white people's land. And um, so when you know when I, we, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with people about reparations yes. and what does that look like for Elaine for my community. And if you're talking reparations, to me, come to Elaine and you you'll see where you know. Uh, the income of Elaine is, you know, a little bit over twelve thousand dollars per cap. You know, that's mm -hmm. that's the average income, uh, forty one percent poverty level. Exactly. And we have no, there's no grocery store, there's no clinic, there's, you know, our schools are gone, but there's yeah, still good people there. And you want to talk reparations? I can't put a number on it. Mm -hmm. Well, how much you think everyone should get? First of all, you know, the Elaine massacres destroyed so many connections family connections yes. people lost you know you don't know who died in the church you don't know who died in the fields working you don't know who fled a lot mm -hmm. of them just you know they fled they kept going they didn't come back and then yes. they changed their names because Absolutely. it was against the yeah it was against the law to owe owe the landowner's money for your crops you didn't harvest or for what you took at the store. So you're going to change your name and you're not going to tell anybody where you are, who you are. And then the next year, it's the census 1920. And because you're in hiding, because you don't want to, um, people to know who you are or no family connections, you don't even, you know, fill out the information for the census. You're not a part of the census. So mm -hmm. it will be such a massive undertaking to even find all of the descendants. So putting a number on it and how you distribute those funds to me would be, you know, just such a massive undertaking. To me, reparations would be doing just as reparation says, to repair. First of all, you need to reconcile. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the re reconciliation and healing has to happen in Phillips County. Then you repair people that you destroy. Mm -hmm. you, you work the transgenerational trauma. It's just the underbelly of it. It's just stifling. And, you know, repair the community that was destroyed. You know, yeah. my wildest dream, people say, what are your wildest dreams? I would, if the people who own the land where the hoops for church sat, and we all know where it is, if the people that own that land gifted that land to the descendants to build a community, to rebuild hoops for a church, mm -hmm. you know, to create a program for home ownership for mm -hmm. the people currently in the community, because we're descended from people who didn't ask you to give them anything. They were trying to do for themselves and you came, burnt their church down and murdered them. Yes. So, you know, so replace, rebuild. Right now I'm part of, um, uh, an organization there there are nonprofit organizations founded by descendants on the ground in Elaine right now who get overlooked who are ignored underfunded <laughs> and they are they're on the ground working and taking care of the Elaine community we have Elnora Williams who's a 30 year paraprofessional who's founded the Elaine community opportunity seekers and she's you know connecting the youth with the elders so we can get keep that history yes. you know you know the youth are you know the youth are interviewing the elders and getting those stories that is come in and help story. yes come in and help fund her she's a descendant born and bred in elaine graduated come in help fund her and we have the we were gifted the mm -hmm. elaine high school 
So the Elaine High School Alumni Association, we are uh, working to rehab the Elaine High School and rehab it and make it and create a community hub to put all of these organizations in and start doing the restorative justice work and honoring our ancestors, Elaine 12 and those who were lost. Absolutely. So um, there's so much on the ground that could be repaired, rebuilt, uh, people could invest in and people like Anora Williams and Candace Williams, you have or escape. These are people right now in Elaine on the ground doing the work who partnered with me and we've created the Elaine Empowerment Project mm -hmm. uh, to seek restore, you know, restorative justice and talk with people about reparations. But our voices are like this because we don't have the money. We don't have the, the, the power. We don't have the connections. I have to partner with someone to even get a congressperson to talk to me. That's what I had to do. Yeah, I, you know, I, I sent an email totally ignored but when I partner with an organization then yeah so um and part of the reparations is don't leave the ones who were affected the descendants don't leave their voices out I had to create an organization so my voice could be heard so right. um well, may I ask you have you incorporated your organization as a non-profit entity no, uh, the uh, descendants of Elaine, not yet. I'm working okay, on that, not yet. May I give you mm -hmm. a couple of, you do that right away and get and become mm -hmm. non nonprofit so that you mm -hmm. can go out and ask for funding, grant funding, mm -hmm. and so forth, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and know that you are an organization with some clout because they're not going to give you any clout. The other thing, oh, yeah, suggest that you work with some attorneys because uh, Rosewood was able to get pro bono. Oh, yeah. And, and if you are able to get a, a group of attorneys uh, to work with you, a, a large firm, because these small ones can't help you, but get mm -hmm. a large firm, uh, let your story be known, and maybe mm -hmm. uh, you could get an attorney group to support what you are doing. Another yeah. thing that I'm going to say, and we use the word reparations, but mm -hmm. with Rosewood, they did not use the term reparation because it made the folks angry. And it was a dangerous word. Yes, so that's why I don't they, use they it. Did not use it when they filed with the state of Florida. They said that the citizens were good citizens and they had not been taken care of. Good citizens <laughs> had not been taken care of. These citizens had paid their taxes through 1924. This happened in 1923. And they put in documents and showed that these people were living well and had paid their bills and they had a right to be compensated. That okay. was how they kind of approached it. And they pulled back on the word uh, reparations at that time. Mm -hmm. And then after the bill passed and some other things came out, then you saw the term reparations all over the place. But during yep. the time of when they were really stressed, they, they were very careful in how they used that word. They said that these people were economically able to take care of themselves and the family members lost, meaning that if you lose your land, the child that comes behind has no inheritance. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of things that they pushed with the state of Florida in order to help get that bill through. The other thing, you got to have some white people on your side. Mm -hmm. Because they were able mm -hmm. to find white people who told almost the same story Stories. Mm -hmm. the African Americans. Now, they respect the white man. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. The white man went in there and told that story pretty much the same. He was in Rosewood. He was 18 years old. He was an adult. Mm -hmm. We can believe him. We can't believe mm -hmm. you African Americans because you all were children. You were eight, nine years old being taken out of here. So you don't count. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things that you got to kind of strategize and work toward mm -hmm. finding organizations and people and situations. Have you uh, talked to EGI Equal Justice Initiative? Yes. Yes. Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. yes, as a matter of fact, the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement, they're a part and connected uh, to them. Mm -hmm. yes, and and you're right about the word, yeah, you're right about the word reparations. And that's why I use the word restorative justice. Yes, and just restorative yeah, justice. Yes. Justice and you wanting to, to restore. Yeah. Sometimes You're right. And then you just <laughs> sit and listen. <laughs> and you pick up on their attitudes and then you, 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 you counteract it and work with mm -hmm. it. 
Uh, but those are just a few things that come to mind right away. And then also you, the, the uh, government has to be on your side. Like with Rosewood, Governor Lawton Charles was on the side of helping to get this done. Plus there were several other people that were in authority that came forth like judges to support it. And so mm -hmm. you got to get some of those people in key positions to stand where you can't stand and go where you can't go to help exactly. you get things through. You know, yeah. Lisa, you were talking about how difficult it is to figure out the numbers. I mean, we're talking about mm -hmm. communities who were wiped out. And wiped we, know, out. we know of Rosewood. We know of Elaine. We know of the Greenwood District in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are communities we don't know about. And when you start mm -hmm. talking about what might have happened in other parts of Arkansas or Florida or Georgia or Alabama, you really begin to get a scope of mm -hmm. how this economic inequity grew and multiplied and mm -hmm. and became even in, uh, harder to discern what damages were done over this oh, yeah. this era. You got to put the information out for everybody and you got to mm -hmm. start putting newspaper magazine articles out and talking about it in the community, getting on the news, on the ball mm -hmm. teams, on the sports activities, bring it up. Rosewood had a baseball team. Talk about it that way. Uh, talk okay. about it in other activities that your people, especially farmers, I mean, because farmers were, were key to growth. And mm -hmm. if we didn't have the farmers, people couldn't eat. And then mm -hmm. on the, and, and going back to the cotton, now were you all growing that Sea Island cotton over there in your area? Sea Island cotton uh, gave off more growth than the regular cotton. And so again, that would have been another way to say if they were growing sea island cotton, they were more important than somebody growing the regular cotton that didn't produce oh. as much. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So yeah. you, you kind of pull those situations together and, and present it to them in a positive way. Positive. Yeah. And yeah. that made but, help. And I know that rep, reparations uh is just, you know, and when I talk about it, it's uh just if we would be able to realize our ancestors' dreams, you know, yeah. and and know the value of when you say we can't put value on it. Yes, we can. We can put a value mm -hmm. on it right quick because they do it for everything else and they can mm -hmm. do it for reparations. If yeah. they, but they yeah. play yeah. games with, with that, you know, oh, we can't figure that out. It has been figured out to the T mm -hmm. as to what mm -hmm. should be based on the number of years where you were, your uh, census counts, male, female, number of kids, all of that has been done. It's always mm -hmm. done quickly for other cultures when yeah, they man. give them a sense of reparations, the Japanese and others. They know yeah. they and so they can do it now for African-Americans, but they refuse and they act like it's such a chore and it can't be done. So mm -hmm. we have to realize that the games are being played right on and we have to get past some of them or else know who they are and how to maneuver within those games. Have you yes, all been in touch with other communities or descendants of other communities who are, who are out to who are you know in search of, of essentially the same thing we're trying to organize a parallel effort and are looking to either elaine or to rosewood for mm -hmm. uh, for guidance or for inspiration or for technical support mm -hmm. i have not but i would love to be in contact with those in tulsa yes i, I know that their their 100 anniversary is coming up this you know their 100 year anniversary of, their, of the uh, tulsa uh, right. massacre is coming up this year well, I have your email and they just put out another um, a long email today from Rose, from uh, the Tulsa area. I'm gonna start mm -hmm. sending you some of their information. Right now, the, the, their emphasis is dealing with the dead, the cemeteries. Mm -hmm. You all mm -hmm. have cemeteries in your area. Did you have a cemetery that was left after the ch church was burned down? That you no. can still go back and find bodies, I mean, not find the bodies, but the headstone, nothing there, okay. Nothing so, there. This is one of the routes that they're using right now with the 1921 uh, uh, situation Tulsa. in Tulsa. They're mm -hmm. going back and they're, they've, they've got the census and they get, and see, you have another problem there. 1920 was the census and this happened in 19. But see, you can 19. Mm -hmm. get the earlier census and pull whatever you can from that. You can get yeah. some of your bank records, um, any government type record that you can put your hands on to verify and then mm -hmm. percentage that out, you can, you can determine what yeah. it would be. Yeah. Well, what we do have, I, yeah, we do have the hundred and I know that 
Um, I just posted it on the descendants page, the 122 Elaine defendants um, mm -hmm. who were, you know, and they were, you know, survive survivors of the yes. massacre. Mm -hmm. yes. So we have their names and I'm looking at this list and I'm seeing names on this list of, you know, that's been in Elaine all of my life and before. So yes, you know, that, that's true. helped, the, mm, yeah, and that's helped descendants kind of find those connections. I'm having them email me and say, oh, you know, you know, but when I they saw the list and seeing names of, you know, their ancestors on there. Family so that's, that's only, never, not only yeah. your black families, do the white families too. Yeah. You had to do the white families that mm -hmm. were down there and in those areas, the yearly families, mm -hmm. the different white families and say, hey, you got eight generations here. Look at the wealth you have today. And then we went back and actually looked at the land because the land was taken. And in your case, I'm sure it was taken and stolen and not mm -hmm. paid very much for. And mm -hmm. then see, you know, work the value of that land and what they put on that land, how much money they made on that land every year on certain things. The, the lumber business mm -hmm. was big down there. And oh so, yeah, the, uh, the cotton business Georgia was booming. Pacific, Georgia Pacific came down there and they bought up a lot of that land. And companies like that, uh, that have had agricultural needs in those communities. Those are the folks that you need to get on board to let them know that yes, this happened. And yes, you all reap some of the benefits from this by the land being turned over to the other folk. And so there's also ongoing, there's the ongoing legwork to find more descendants. I mean, presumably even yes. in Rosewood, you haven't found everybody who is, you know. Who no, we'll never find, in fact, we yeah. just got some people out of New Jersey the other day had changed their names twice. And then we found a man in Finland and his great grandfather was in Rosewood. But the, the mm -hmm. young man in the Finland, he's in his sixties now and he had changed his mm -hmm. name. So it, you yeah. will never get them all, but they will come back to you when they see websites and ways that they can connect yes. to you. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. to get your website up and start and they, they'll start coming in. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. Sherry, thank you so much. Cause it's one of the hardest things that has been in doing this work is um, having, and that's again, a reason why I started um, the page was to have the voice of the descendants leading this charge, Yes, you know, leading this charge. And the reason why, you know, I have, uh, you know, I, my classmates and, and, you know, people that are help, helping doing this work and, you know, down in Elaine. Mm -hmm. So um, just having, you, you know, letting people know we're here. Uh, the descendants are here. We're doing this work. We're available to talk. We're ready to collaborate and work with anyone uh, yes. who, who wants to work with us. We're here and trying to make, you know, our voices, the Elaine Empowerment Project, make our voices louder over the fray because you have those who, you know, there are books written about the Elaine massacre and never not one written by a descendant. Absolutely. Not one has been, that. not right. one, and yeah, not one book about the Elaine Massacre has been written uh, by a descendant, and not one has been written by a person of color, not one person from Elaine. And that's because they could get those records that you couldn't get your hands on, and they mm -hmm. could get the bank. So that's why my story is about, yes. Yeah. They mm -hmm. could get what they needed, and I know what you're speaking of, because I've met a couple of authors that wrote about Elaine. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So... Yeah, but just just uh, breaking the silence of the ancestors and uh, making sure our voices, our descendants, the, those of us in Elaine, that our voices are heard and that we're leading this charge. And um, so that's some of the work that we're working on. That's what we're doing in Elaine. And, you know, uh, the people on my team, Julian Watson and Aura Scape and uh, Candace Williams and Mr. Elnora and Mr. And, and Pastor Gibson still down there now working, doing this work. And um, that's part of my charge is to elevate the people, that especially the descendants down at Elaine that are currently doing this work and letting people know they're there, we're here. And we're working on the restorative justice um, initiatives, um, the historical preservation of mm -hmm. Elaine. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're working on that, working, we're gonna be working on those stories. Um, gonna get the Elaine High School that was blessingly gifted to us by the Marvel Elaine School District. Oh. Um, yes, we, we are, they, they gave, blessed, gifted, deeded the Elaine High School mm -hmm. to 
the Elaine High School Alumni Association. So we all collectively own a building, own this school, this property where our parents and grandparents wasn't even allowed to attend. Well, what you so, need to do with uh, that school immediately is turn it around and put some businesses in there to make an income for you so you can keep working. Put that's what we're working. That's and exactly. Put, I don't know what you have in it, but put mm -hmm. some businesses in there that will generate some money to help you to keep this project going. That's exactly what we plan on doing. And I'm, I'm hoping this conversation here will generate uh, people let people know we're there and we're here. And now the Elaine High School Alumni Association, it is a nonprofit. It is okay. a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It has this nonprofit status. The um, um, Elaine Community Opportunity Seekers ran by Eleanor Williams. She does some beautiful work, beautiful work in Elaine. It's a nonprofit. It is the first and only nonprofit founded by descendants in Elaine. That's beautiful. And, and she is there doing the work. And um, we we have to work to elevate these these uh, organizations on the ground in Elaine and and get people to know that they're there. May I say this to you? Yes, ma'am. Even though it's an atrocity, and we know, and we are black, and we understand, when the information comes out, they're going to deal with other issues. They do mm -hmm. not really want to deal with us as a people. I have, we mm -hmm. have to fight to get them to remember the names of the people who were killed down there. They Amen. want to talk about Rosewood every day, but they mm -hmm. don't want to talk about these folks that got killed and were, were unable to uh, leave the area. They don't mm -hmm. want to talk about us. They ignore the culture yes. and talk about the housing and the land and the trees mm -hmm. and other things of that nature, the economics mm -hmm. of the area and the other culture of the area. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing. We set up an area to uh, work with the other cultures. I'm talking whites, mm -hmm. Mexicans, and everybody else, because we all are one when you look at it. And because mm -hmm. we did that, and, and we have had programs to honor them for what they've mm -hmm. done for living in that area, and it brought them in. Otherwise, yeah. they would not have come in and said a word. And then you got to mm -hmm. get to those white churches. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's key. One min I've seen ministers that lost their audience because they said that they would help us. Minister mm -hmm. had to leave the area. So I'm you, you got to cross over and say that you can relate to all, but yet yes. keep your goals in mind. And, and also remember, however you are going through this, that time is, is, is not in our favor because in 30 yes. or 40 years, we're out of here. We got to pass it mm -hmm. on to our youth. This Amen. is most important. This is the purpose of everything. We're making a legacy. Legacy. So we can pass mm -hmm. on to the next generation and let mm -hmm. them continue to keep things going for us. Have yeah. either of y'all had any buy-in from, from white descendants of the white people who were on the attacking side of the massacres? I and mean, what, what does that yes. look like? I have I have been in contact with um Chester Johnson. Chester Johnson wrote, and last year his book came out. He wrote Damage Heritage. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm, uh, reconciliation. Uh, the, Elaine Mas the Elaine Massacre and a story of reconciliation. And he connected with Sheila Walker, I saw uh, a descendant. Mm -hmm, she's a uh, descendant from Albert Giles, one of the Elaine 12, uh, mm -hmm. and one of my dear, 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 dear friends. And uh, she and Chester collaborated on the book, and it did very well. When I saw his book, I reached out to him. And I had to tell him, thank you. Because of all the other books, his book was one he spoke of, which is very much a part of, you know, what we're doing uh, in Elaine and with the descendants is reconciliation because we can't move forward in any way if we don't, if we don't, all of us in Phillips County and those on either side of the massacre understand that reconciliation has to happen, healing, has to happen. Amen. And what was his it has to happen, but his his father, his grandfather was with the KKK and went down to Elaine and helped and participated. I should and I say participated, but um and he's reached out again to me because he's um I'm doing a follow-up book. He's his publishing company is asked to do a follow-up book. And so he's asked me to participate in that and um that's yeah, so he and I'm I'm hoping that he and I on, on these parallel sides that
that us joining forces and possibly doing some work in Elaine will help motivate and, and, and inspire, you know, um, Phillips County to, yeah. um, you know, join forces with us in this, in this reconciliation and healing movement, so. You know, presumably, well, I mean, it, it certainly isn't the, the, there are many tasks that lay ahead, but presumably one of them is, is finding descendants of the white people, you know, really developing mm -hmm. the chain of white people who are descended from uh, clan members, National Guard members, so on and so forth, who participated in the massacre. I mean, being a white person with roots in the South myself, I've had to do a little bit of digging into the nastiness my great grandfather, you know, committed during the union movement in Alabama, mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. you know, and you spoke a good point there. That has been very important to us as well, to know the Jewish cultures and the other cultures who have been involved, because they can give you details that you don't know, because mm -hmm. they were in the Klan, uh, in other groups of that magnitude, and they knew the mm -hmm. people, they knew who got to the waterways, how they got away, and things that we couldn't pick up because we were running in the woods trying to survive, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> so yes. therefore, you got across the cultures and talk kindness to them, talk healing to them. Um, Definitely healing, healing. Yes, yes, yes. You speak the terms that they can relate to and many of them will come across and share with you. And, and mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing, if you catch them on their dying bed, we've had more people to call us and say, so-and-so is very ill, can you come see him? And we come with the microphone and they, they give us a, what I call a deathbed confession. And, and mm. tell us names and information that we would not have gotten otherwise. But they mm. wanted to be right when they crossed over. This is what one man told us. And he mm. was, since he was getting ready to cross over, he wanted the word to be straight. And he wouldn't even let the children stay in the room when he talked to us. Mm. He said, bring the tape recorder and, and you all in here. Because he said, my children are getting mad. And so he mm. talked to us and gave us terms and names and people and situations we would have never had. If they know you out here, Liz, and they do, after a while they will, and they will uh, build up a confidence in you and what mm -hmm. you're doing and the community, they'll start mm -hmm. calling you in. I've been to yeah. the hospitals, I've been to the nursing homes, I've been to places that I really didn't feel good in going, but I went because these people wanted to talk and that's most important that they have a right to talk now, some of them, we had to put 10 years on this, said we can't put this interview out for 10 years. We, you know, whatever they say, we will do. But the point yeah. of it is the history that they have given us, eventually the kids down the road will be able to use this history. Yeah. They will be able to help their families as well. So it's important that once they know you're out here, especially those in other cultures, they'll start talking. And they, like I said, they're in the church. They want to clear their records. They want to see the master. And they'll tell mm -hmm. you that. And you just yeah. sit and talk and let them ramble all they feel like rambling because they're going to ramble. But they will get it across to you. And it seems like their souls are, are pleased. And they said they can go and rest in peace. Yeah. Oh and that's what I've learned that it's, heal it's healing. On, I'm going to say this real quick. I know you have sure. to go. But understanding, and I'm thinking about the healing that's had to take place among the descendants. And I recognize in speaking with Chester, and that's why I said he helped my healing so much is that those whose uh, ancestors committed these atrocities, they have healing to do as well. That's true. And I recognize that, and I'm, I'm so grateful to him and, and happy to collaborate with him. Okay. All right. I was that's beautiful. Mention. You're doing a wonderful work. I'm extremely proud of you. I'm telling you. you Thank are you. Thank you, you Michelle. Uh, yes, ma'am, you are. You, you are, as they say, you're going on the rocks and places where others have not tread, and you're coming mm -hmm. out with good work. So you are Thank to be you. commended. Now, I know about some of those other books, but like I said, they didn't do what you did. You know, Thank they you. took it from an academic perspective, and that's it. And it's truly not telling the Black story. Since we only have a couple of minutes, I wanted to make sure before our time expired, I oh. told people how they can learn more, how they can connect mm -hmm. and, and help, you know, educate. So Sherry, how can people find out more about Rosewood? How can they connect with you and how can they help, you know, share the story? Okay. We can uh, give you our website. Uh, I believe you have that, Paul. It's oh, yeah. rememberingrosewood.com. And it's the most thorough site out here on the history of Rosewood. It was founded with family members and friends. 
So Rosewood is called Remembering Rosewood, rememberingrosewood.org, O-R-G, is because we are incorporated. Lisa, how can okay. people connect with you? People can reach out to us at Descendants of Elaine, uh, Descendants of Elaine, of the Elaine Massacre of 1919 on our Facebook page and email descendants of Elaine at gmail.com. That's Descendants of the Elaine Massacre of 1919, our Facebook page, and email at descendants of Elaine at gmail.com. And Lisa, okay. you're doing so much, but you're also putting working on a book, right? Yes, I am working on a book of the stories my grandmother told me the five years I interviewed her. Um, it's a story of healing. It's a story of uh, learning about my beloved Elaine and that I bragged on and then at one point hate it and yeah. had to find my way back to. Mm -hmm. I threw some healing and say, it wasn't Elaine that I held up. It was the people who raised me and built me were the people I bragged on and built up. And one of those people, you know, my grandmother and all of the survivors and uh, the descendants, my ancestors. So, and yeah, this is gonna be a book of healing, a book of reconciliation, and most importantly, talking about the dangers of silence and the history left out and connections and generations lost through that silence. So. You're into something very, very important. I will mention, we do have a book called The Rosewood Massacre at a glance, and it tells the whole story with pictures and everything in it. It tells about the historic marker, our traveling exhibit, plus we've got a movie. So uh, all of this- Oh yeah. And you can uh, contact us, like I said, Rosewood, uh, I'm sorry, rememberingrosewood.org. Thank you. Kyle, any final, any final questions or should we do our kind of wrap up thoughts? Well, I will say one thing. Black history is 365 days because this is Black History Month. This is just a short span. History needs to be infused from all cultures to make this good world what it is today. And we've got to stop just having certain parts of history and other parts not taken care of. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Rosewood Heritage Foundation for allowing us this opportunity. And I want to work with you, Liz, to help you as much as I can in your future. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa, any, any final comments? Uh, yes. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, Elaine, to my community, to the wonderful people down there doing the work. Um, and those who allow me <laughs> to be, you know, to speak on their behalf, the descendants that allow me to speak on their behalf, I, you know, and allow me to speak for our ancestors and that allow me to go forward and do this work to honor them respectfully. And to all of those who are allowing, now allowing the descendants a seat at the table and allowing our voices to be heard and allowing us and putting us into leadership uh, positions. Um, but thank you very much. And I wanna let everyone know we're here. We can, we can speak and we're ready to work and organize and move forward in um, restorative justice and reconciliation and healing for our community and hopes that spreads out through the rest of the country. Paul? I think the, the subtext that I was hoping to get out in, in the episode and the subtext that I've been trying to bring up here is that the history of the wealth gap, the history of the vast chasm between, you know, mm -hmm. vast economic chasm is not exclusively a black history and that the mm -hmm. wealth gap is created by the action, you know, is, cre is created by the actions historically of, of, of white America and white Southerners, mm -hmm. and, you know, white Southerners and white Americans across the country. And so by kind of bringing up the point about you know, finding the white descendants of those responsible for the massacres. What and and you know by you know in the in the in the episode talking about kind of the way in which support for black businesses was used by the Nixon administration to emphasize um, how kind of uh, to, to kind of shift responsibility for addressing the wealth gap onto black business owners. I think you know I think it's it's just pretty important in any conversation about reparations, which is really about you know mm -hmm. essentially white America 
providing reparations it you know it's, it's vital to it's vital to kind of emphasize that it you know these things involve for what for white southerners for white americans in general these things are the products of our ancestors too and you know the white people have been involved in the creation and maintenance of the wealth gap and in various in, and in you know, in various sincere or insincere attempts to address it for a very long time so um so it, it's it's worth not uh I, you know, it's worth it's worth white people giving serious consideration to uh, the historical, you know, the very clear historical wrongdoings that are being addressed by these particular projects because our ancestors were directly involved in those too. We're not we're not mm -hmm. you know at arm's length from those. Mm -hmm. and, and we could go on, right? The inequity yeah. of the yes. application <laughs> of the GI Bill, uh, right. redlining, mm -hmm. and and it and it's decades and decades. My goodness, I mean, yeah, yeah. The history of, of, I mean, the the massive, in, the you know, white America ceased to be, you know, wh poverty, white poverty in the United States dropped dramatically after the after the depression because of un, you know inequal, uh, inequitable uh, allocation of anti poverty programs, um, like things right. like the GI Bill, and so it's I think it's easy to it's easy for white people to assume that. Uh, you know, to, to kind of kind of project the the bootstraps myth onto that period of you know between the 1930s and the 1950s and their family when in reality you know that is a period that fed the wealth gap and so is the period from the late 60s through the 80s i mean with the um the decline of, of industrialization so you know yeah uh, yeah <laughs> may i have just one more word to say please yes uh i'd like to tell you that the first reparations was done during the time of the civil war and the lady's name is Henrietta Woods, Henrietta <clears throat> Woods. And the history has pursued this. And yesterday in the Washington Post newspaper, Washington Post yesterday has a very long article about it. This is the first mm. reparation. Reparations. Mm. And this woman got two, uh, let's see, I forgot exactly. It was a little over $2,000, but she was the very first and it's in the paper from yesterday. Uh, it's called, She Sued Her Enslavers for Reparations and Won. Her <laughs> descendants never knew. And then you can see how all the seven generations after her have proceeded and how they have uh, progressed and how she had to live. Her name was Henrietta Wood, W-O-O-D. But just go to yesterday's the 24th of uh, February of the Washington Post. And this has been the first record that we have been able to find. And then let me give you one other source. There is a, 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 a book. It is called, um, the book is about uh, slavery and it's called Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution. And this is one of the first books that was written that this talks about reparations and slavery and also Henrietta Wood is in that book so as we know today as what we've been able to find in history is she's the first to receive reparations from her slave master and she was sold five times wow. but she was very forward and you read the story you you will just be amazed at how that lady survived and she died in the early 1900s I think it's about 1910 or somewhere along there but this mm -hmm. is the beginning as we know it as African people and as the culture. And yesterday, this, this was off the chain as one would say in the sense of people trying to find out <laughs> about reparations and how it has progressed through the hundreds of years that we know today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sherry Dupree, thank you. Lisa Hicks Gilbert, thank you. Paul Kiefer, thank you. thank you. Corey Williams with the Fayetteville Public Library, thank you so much. For, for helping organize this. Lee Wood, thank you for helping behind the scenes produce this. You can hear the episodes at KUAF.com of the movement that never was. One more time, rememberingrosewood.org. Go to the Facebook page, Descendants of the Elaine Massacre of 1919. Sherry, Lisa, we'd love to hear from you again. Thank you, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank, thank, you, thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Pleasure yes. to be here. Thank you. <laughs>